In part one of Bargain Racement, we bought a Citroen C1 to see if we could go racing for less than the cost of a reasonably high-end sim racing rig. We stripped the interior out and started to install the parts that are mandatory for the series, including the roll cage, footrest, seat base, door cards, and the rain light. Well, that's it for the mandatory stuff inside the car, so now we'll turn our attention to the stuff outside, and we'll start with these polyurethane bushings. They may look innocuous, but they can be tricky to fit. However, they make quite a difference to the handling, and we've got to fit them. So, let's get on with it. Most OEM bushings are designed to minimise NVH. They isolate the driver and passengers from noise, vibration and harshness. They're basically there to just stop the car rattling your fillings out. What they aren't designed to do, for the most part, is allow the car to have pin-sharp handling. Now, we're not saying that these new polyurethane parts will make it turn in like a single-seater, but they should make it less like an oil tanker. And that's a good thing. After removing the wheels and junking the splash guards, the ABS wiring is pulled off. Then I use my sucky thing to slurp most of the brake fluid out. Crack off the brake hose banjo bolt, whip it out and let gravity drain out the rest of the old fluid. Nick never throws anything out, which is why the shed is piled high with stuff he calls full of latent usefulness, and what most of us would term crap that needs chucking. But even he won't stoop to keeping used brake fluid, so it'll get burnt along with most of the interior. There are a number of techniques to removing the trackboard ends from the upright, but this is my preferred method. Impact guns and massive hammers. See? Always does the trick. There are six new bushes in the front here. Two in each of the bottom arms, and two that hold the anti-roll bar on. It's a bit of a pain, but to get to the anti-roll bar bushes, the entire subframe needs to come off, which is why I'm disassembling the whole front suspension. That, and the fact that I've got a shiny new set of coilovers to fit a little later on, along with braided brake hoses, discs and pads. Mmm, shiny. After undoing the nut, the bottom ball joint gets the twatting stick treatment. This little bracket that holds the brake pipe up is inexplicably held on by an M8 fastener. Toyota Overkill is my second favourite type of kill. The upright is attached to the strut by friction. This great big bolt clamps the upright around the strut body. So once the bolt is removed, you can gently tap the upright off the strut. Now I can take the bottom arms out. To make it easier to remove the struts, and get at stuff we'll need to attend to later, the wiper arm comes off. Along with the plastic scuttle panel, and the pressed steel panel that sits underneath. Now it's a shed load easier to get at the top mounts. Yeah, manky. Now the subframe can come off. Right. Oh shit. Hanging on something. Steering right. Is it just held up on those nut on those bolts? Yeah. I mean, I could probably go and get you the lever bar, but I'm just not going to. Oh, thanks, mate. Behind you. Uh, it's behind you. I think so. Yes. Oh, okay. They say that hindsight is 2020. Yeah, no. Could maybe have broken it on the car. Yeah, alright. I need somebody to help me hold it. 
This bolt I'm struggling with holds the engine steady bar, which has a rubber bush in it to dampen vibration. The polyurethane upgrade kit contains a stuffer that takes up the voids within that bush to stiffen it up. What we need now is the big hydraulic press. Or maybe not. It doesn't get any easier than that, so on to the mildly more tricky front anti-roll bar bushes. The OEM rubber ones have done a few miles and are far too squishy, so the new Powerflex ones should bring an improvement. Bridge, bridge. The supplied lube is smeared all over the shaft to allow for free movement and to stop those annoying squeaks. You don't want squeaks in your race car. The new bushes are surprisingly stiff and they take some wrestling to get onto the bar. Well, now it can all go back together. I think six Ugga Duggas is enough for any M10 bolt. Smooth, smooth. Time for a fight with the engine steady brace. I think you'll find it was down to the correct application of force and a shed load of lube. But now that's done, the subframe can go back on the car. We'll leave it all loose for now because there's some adjustment designed into it. We'll measure it up in relation to the rear axle once we've finished that and then tighten it all up square. The bottom arms are next and the bottom board joint is absolutely fine so that doesn't need replacing, it's just the two bushes which require a swap. And that necessitates the big press to push the old ones out. If you haven't got access to a flipping great big press like this, it is possible to remove the bushes with a big hammer, some sockets and a vice. Alternatively, take the lot to your local garage and they would probably be able to help for a small fee. The old one has gone and a new bush is pressed in. We tried this one a few times and it never wanted to go in square, so in the end, I just sent it. Lube up thoroughly the inner part of the bush and then just slide it in. Well that's one done and the other side is just two top hat shaped inserts and a steel sleeve that gets pressed into the middle. Dead straightforward. Do all that twice, and you get two bottom arms that are ready to go back on the car. Okay. The anti-roll bar drop links are, I think the term is, shagged. So we splashed out 15 quid on a pair of new ones. We'll add that to the total spend coming up later on. That's all the bushes we have to fit, bar two. And I'm tired of doing all the work around here, so it's over to my colleague while I go and put the kettle on, because he's been slacking in that department as well.
The scabby old bush put up a good fight, but judicious use of a blowtorch and our invaluable sleeve kit saw it off in the end. The area gets a thorough de-scabbing and the burrs are removed before Nick slides in the new bush. Last but not least, the steel sleeve is pressed in and thankfully, that's the end of the bush odyssey. After we've refitted the axle, obviously. All about the angle, don't you? It is. Yep, that's started, that's good. We got it. In the kit of parts comes the shiny new coilovers from Gaz. Designed and built especially for this series, the kit comes with spec springs and the rears already have polyurethane bushes installed. They are single adjustable, so that rebound and compression damping is adjusted from a single control knob at the side of the damper. The rears have helper springs to keep the main spring on its seats when the wheel is unloaded. Fitting them is dead easy. Pass the top up through the hole where the original damper went. Fit the supplied polyurethane spacer, washer and nut. Jack the axle up to line up the bottom of the damper and put the original bolt back in. Beautiful thing. Okay. Got it, got it, there you go. And that's it, really. We're just going to set the spring platforms at a nominal measurement for now, having no idea what the ride height will be like. We'll set this up properly later. Give or take. Okay. The front coilovers look similar, except they've no need for a helper spring. And there's no bush at the bottom, and the adjustment is done at the top. Apart from that, they're quite similar. Adjusting these bad boys requires a special knob. Luckily, we've got one. We've also got this, which allows us to change the damping rates. Fitting the strut to the hub is a case of lining up the peg, and then hitting it with hammers. Then the big bolt goes in, which needs all of the Ugga Duggers and a tweak with the show spanners just to be sure. Yeah, I can't do anything with it. We spent 40 quid on a pair of new top mounts and bearings, as apparently we're not allowed a nice spherical type setup, and the OG ones had seen better days. Time to put it all together. Now the whole strut and upright assembly can get installed on the car, which is reasonably straightforward. Cool. The rest of the reassembly can now take place, starting with the drive shaft. Then the bottom ball joint can go in. <laughs> Right. 
Can I move? Oh, I think I can just move it. I might need your help. I know that's unlikely. Yeah, unlikely, but. Yeah. Go on, you can do it. Okay. You can do it. You can do it. Well, I can do it, but it's much easier if you help me. Where's the fun in that? <laughs> Watching you struggle is one of my few joys. It isn't. Oh, yes. Apart from the exterior being constantly beaten up, the interior being filthier than Victoria Corn Mitchell, the underpinnings of this car are surprisingly good. It didn't need wheel bearings, bottom ball joints or track rod ends, and it shows signs of being well serviced. So, not having to shell out on those items is a boon. Nick consented to a new split pin for the track rod end, and the original clip goes back on the castellated bottom ball joint nut, before the big drive shaft nut gets all of the impacts. Finally, the nut is staked into the recess on the drive shaft. And that's the suspension sorted. Woo! And might I add, who? On to the next job, which is to fit the exhaust back box. This sporty looking silencer takes the place of the restrictive original back box and is sure to increase engine performance. Or not. Anyway, it has a center exit and twin chrome exhaust tips and quite frankly that's good enough for me. Plus, it's designed as a direct replacement, so we should be able to just bolt it on. Only we can't, because unfortunately, some helpful soul decided to forego the normal method of joining the exhaust come the last MOT. Yep, there should be two mating faces and a clamp here, but someone just migged it up. There isn't a single join on the whole exhaust, so we had to shell out £27 on a new centre section. Of course, we didn't have a clamp either, so there's another four quid. The original exhaust hangers met with an accident, so three new ones cost about a tenner, and the tattered ring piece needed replacing for three quid. Get your mind out of the gutter, guys. Crikey. One of the great things about these cars is that all of the service items are as cheap as cheese. They're common across the three platforms and available pretty much from any motor factor off the shelf. Second hand bits on Flea Bay are plentiful and inexpensive, but being basically a Toyota in all but name, very little goes wrong with them. Given that the three rubber hangers are all that hold the entire exhaust to the car, the Jubilee clips around them are just a failsafe. It's imperative the chrome tips are level, isn't it? Make the noise! If nothing else, at least it looks purposeful. Time now, I think, for a brew. Well, that's it for the mandatory mechanicals, but there's still a few bits in the kit we have to fit. And we'll start with this blanking plate for the radio. We'll come to the whys and wherefores of the hole in the plate in the next episode. I'm sure some of you can guess what it's for. What it definitely isn't for is a reset button. All I've got to do is drill holes in the fascia, make standoffs for the bolts, and screw it all together. Rocket surgery this ain't. I'm not clipping this in yet because there's lots to do before it doesn't need to come out again. There's two remaining items left in the mandatory kit. There's this weight box that will contain any ballast we might have to run, but looking at my lardy arse, it's doubtful we'll need any at all. And there's the wheels and tyres. The attractive ATS wheels are mated to a Nankang NS2R tyre with a sporty 120 treadwear compound and a 165 5015 size. We can't fit the weight box nor the wheels until we've done a few other tasks, so we'll leave those for now. That might be it for the kit of parts, but there's still a few things we're required to do to be eligible for the championship, and we'll start by modifying the steering lock. The rules state that the steering lock mechanism must be removed or rendered permanently inoperative. So, that's what we'll do. Taking the assembly out is not as easy as it sounds. It's held in by an anti-tamper bolt that has no head, so a chisel and hammer and a pair of mole grips are deployed to get the screw out. After unplugging the electrics, push down on the sprung-loaded detent and the lock barrel slides out. Now onto Nick's favourite part, which is hacking it to pieces with the angle grinder. Mm. 
the flappy wheel smooths the surface off and it's now ready to go back on. Doing this is just a safety thing. There's now no chance of the steering lock engaging whether the key is in it or not. For this to be a mandatory thing, this must have happened to some poor soul. Anyway, it's sorted now, so on to the next thing. Which is the rear tailgate lock. According to the rules, our keyed opening mechanism is no good. We've got to swap it for the central locking type push button version. So we shelled out 30 quid on a used assembly. Pretty sure we're going to need this bit. It makes sense for the marshals to be able to open the tailgate in the event of an emergency without having to try and find the key for it. But it doesn't half make it tricky to secure the vehicle when you've popped to the shops for a kebab. All these mandatory mods are there for the safety of the competitors. None of them are particularly difficult, but your first time race car builder might get found out at scrutineering if they've missed them. Best to read the regulations thoroughly twice before starting your project. Uh -huh. Clearly that is off an IGO and not a C1. Not to worry. It still works. And it's actually a lot less likely to get damaged when the rear bumper gets ripped off. What are you talking about? They'll have to catch me first. The last of the obligatory modifications is the replacement of the locking fuel cap with one that doesn't lock. Our original one is completely shagged, so the £15 we spent on the new one would have had to have happened anyway. So, how much have we spent so far, I hear you ask? Well, over to our swanky new feature, the Totalizer. So including the car, the kit, the drop links, the front top mounts, the exhaust centre section, the clamp, fire ring and rubbers along with the tailgate button, fuel cap and some sundries like paint, MIG wire and gas, we've spent £3,929 so far. Well that's it for these series specific bits, but we haven't got a car we can drive let alone compete with. So join us next week where we'll throw another load of parts at our little Citroen C1 to turn it into something we can race.